I, I hope you, you are all enjoying the uh, conference. Uh, my name is uh, Will Tong, and uh, it, it's great pleasure and honor for me to introduce um, our keynote speaker for the conference, uh, Professor Maureen O'Hara. And uh, you know, pe people typically say Maureen doesn't need an introduction. She's so uh, well known. So I'll start with something that you may or may not know. Um, she's actually a citizen of both uh, Ireland and the US. And uh, she's uh, holding, in addition to a PhD degree from uh, Northwestern, um, she's also uh, holding honorary doctor degrees from um, <laughs> the, the, the Faculty Universite Catholic Mons, uh, University of Bern, and University College Dublin. And um, I think we all agree through her, um, you know, research achievements, academic leadership, and, and policy impact, and kind of tireless mentoring um, of uh, you know researchers in the field. She's made seminal contributions to our profession, um, and um, that, you know, Maureen is known as a key co-founder, I would say, for Martin Michael Structure, and she's made exceptional contributions to uh, information economics in general. Um, many of her papers and, and, and work turned out to have profound impact in the industry as well. And one example is the measure of probability of informed trading, the PIN measure, uh, which you know, deals with the, the, the issue of summarizing the impact of private information of security prices and, uh, you know, and, and the behavior of market makers. And that has impacted practitioners around the globe, right? They developed a variety of pill like models um, to assess um, the, uh, you know, and, and price supply and demand of liquidity and related issues. And I, what I really uh, admire and treasure is also that she's a, a Renaissance scholar and she's worked on many other issues beyond market macro structures. Just look at how ambiguity affects uh, you know, asset prices, uh, participation or non-participation, and how that relates to regulations. Do you increase or decrease uh, ambiguity in the market? Um, and lately, uh, she's worked on market uh, ethics, right? the evolution and impact of ethical, uh, ethical behavior in financial markets and networks. And in fact, uh, she's written a book, um, Something for Nothing, Arbitrage and Ethics on Wall Street. I highly recommend that. I, 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 I'm lucky to get an autographed copy uh, from her. Um, They're not hard to find. And so. <laughs> uh, the, the autograph might you know, take, take some work. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and she's just been so prolific and, and open-minded. She's always on the frontier of you know, research. In fact, I think she, uh, and yesterday, Coase mentioned, actually, she wrote one of the first uh, crypto papers, so blockchain papers, right? That's published in JFE. The second paper, you know, with, with uh, Gonzara and, and David and Basu, um, also won the uh, inaugural uh, our inaugural conference best paper award a couple of years ago, and um, and, and they've also worked on machine learning applications in, in market microstructure, and that's one of the earliest machine learning publications in finance. And overall, in her um, illustrious career, I think she's authored over 100 academic articles as well as three books, including the now classic uh, Market Microstructure Theory book that's you know, used as a canon in many schools in, in PhD courses. And uh, you know, in addition to being one of the most cited contemporary social scientists, um, her other accolades uh, include three-time uh, uh, winner for the uh, Smith Britain Distinguished Paper Awards, the WFA, uh, uh, 1999 Best Paper and 2000 Nasdaq Award for Best Paper on Capital Formation, um, you know William Sharp Award for Scholar uh, Scholarship in Financial Research, um, and, and her her recognition uh, goes beyond the academic world. Uh, she was recently named by um, in the journal Portfolio Management and uh, Portfolio Research as the Quant Researcher of the Year last year. Um, and um, she's been sitting on the board for TIAA and, and also the Flash Crash Committee. Uh, and more related to our conference, uh, she's also a uh, advisor for the uh, uh, AVA Labs, that's the lab that's behind uh, Avalanche. And um, I also want to, I know this is 
a little bit longer than usual, but I, I think it's crucial for me to mention that she's. <laughs> Could you flash up one of those? <laughs> That's right. And uh, she, she's been a great uh, mentor. Um, she's always generous with her time in, in guiding, you know, scholars in the field. She's provided invaluable support to many PhD students and junior researchers. Uh, a couple of them are here in the classroom who's written paper after taking her courses and you know, getting uh, advice from her, she uh, really leads by uh, examples. She served as the first female president, actually, of the uh, American Finance Association. And she was also the president for WFA, you know, Financial Management Association and Society of Financial Studies. Um, and, you know, in addition to taking leadership roles on the editorial for RFS and Journal of Financial Intermediation, so on and so forth. Um, and she's been a role model for many finance researchers, uh, especially women in finance, um, through these you know exemplary roles. And um, just you know, I, I kind of want to end this on a more personal note. Uh, when I first started to do research on crypto and blockchain, that that, that wasn't a time that we get a big crowd like this, and you know. Uh, the environment wasn't as encouraging, but Maureen, even though back then I haven't joined Cornell yet, Maureen has always been very encouraging and supportive. And I think that that says say something about her you know, open-mindedness. And um, after I joined Cornell, uh, she's always checking in you know, on me and on other uh, faculty members, uh, scholars at Cornell, uh, periodically, and uh, you know, gave us so many uh, pieces of advice, uh, both for our papers and also uh, career uh, research career in general. And I sent many papers to Maureen, and, and she gave very detailed comments. The, the first comment typically goes something like, do you need 95 pages to write <laughs> about this paper? Um, that's something I'm, I'm still working on. Uh, keep, I think, keep working on it, Will. Uh, pr <laughs> probably I, I, I don't need 95 pages. But I do think I need this long introduction um, to, to introduce someone who's uh, you know, a, a, a role model of true scholarship, right? uh, genuine mentorship and, and exceptional leadership, and a trailblazer for uh, many uh, emerging research topics. So, so without further ado, I'm just going to uh, leave the stage to Maureen, and she's going to tell us about uh, on becoming an asset class. Thank you. Well, thank you, Will. I actually asked Will to make it a short you know, <laughs> intro because the main thing you take away from that is, boy, is she old, you know? <laughs> She's been around forever. Uh, in any case, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here and, and give this talk. And, and I decided, I'm not actually working on Web 3 per se at the moment, so uh, I am working on some uh, microstructure of crypto, which will be buried in here. But I wanted to have a broader conversation because I think, there's a lot of interesting questions that are really finally coming to the fore. I mean, we all, I think, are waiting to see what happens today, I believe it is, with the SEC on you know, the Ethereum ETF. And, and I think now the, the question, in, for me at least, is you know, on becoming an asset class, what's it going to take for this to happen? And basically, you know, the, the good news is Lots of interesting things have happened. Crypto winter is over. Bitcoin spot ETFs are hot. Robinhood's making lots of crypto trades, although I don't know if any of you ever trade on, you, know, you, can, you can actually buy 0. 0.000001 Bitcoin, which is only really, depends on the day. I'm not sure where it is right now, but it's, it's really only six cents, but still lots of trades. Things are definitely looking up, but. I think the question remains, right? Can crypto become an asset class traded by someone other than crypto natives? And uh, until it does, it still remains sidelined. And I think in this room, you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm. For sure it will, except we're not sure. At least I'm not. And certainly there's divided opinion here, right? Some say no, <clears throat> Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. JP Morgan has been, you know, Jamie Dimon has been adamant about this for a while, but he's moving on now. It's a decentralized Ponzi scheme. <laughs> <laughs> so we're making progress, uh, but still, no. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Vanguard says no. 
you know, Vanguard says no because they they put out this really it's it's a thoughtful piece. It says the valuation is just too imprecise, right? And that's actually the same thing. Many of you probably saw an article yesterday, I think it was either in the FT or the Wall Street Journal, about Goldman Sachs asset management. They're saying the same thing. No, right? Uh, the valuation is just too uncertain. It, you know, you're buying a speculative asset. It sounds a little bit like our last paper, right? Uh, that there isn't enough there. Now, we may all disagree, but, but this is important because if you're going to make it as an asset class, you know, you need to make some progress. Others are warming to it. You know, this is Charles Schwab's most recent view, right? We suggest clients approach cryptocurrency as a speculative investment outside traditional asset models and consider the high volatility and risks. But on the other hand, if you want to trade it, we make money off of volume, so we're yours. Um, <laughs> You know, this is, this is kind of a movement, I think, that's positive. And then others are all in, you know, BlackRock. Uh, they're going to offer crypto for institutional investors through Coinbase Prime. So, you know, the, there's a lot of debate still out there about where this is all going. So what do I want to talk about today? Well, <clears throat> I actually want to lead a discussion. And, at the end, if there's time, I, I know we, we lost a lot of time on the intro, but I think we can make it up here. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really talk fast. Because um, I, I, you know, I'm sure there are lots of different opinions on this. And so I think it'd be fun, actually, to share perspectives in, in what time we have. Um, but I think there's so many issues. But I, I just want to sort of think a little bit about three here. One is valuation, right? Can anybody figure out what a cryptocurrency is really worth, right? Because that's what Vanguard wants to know. I actually am going to spend most of my time talking about trading mechanics. And if we want to ask, is this going to become an institutional you know, trading asset, then you need to be able to have it be traded the way that institutions trade. right? And, and that's actually the microstructure issues that really matter. And so I want to spend some time, I want to show you some new work that we've been doing on can the trading and risk management tools used by institutional in other settings apply. And I haven't seen any paper on this, but there's so many papers being written. Maybe some of you have written some, in which case, um, I'm sorry if I didn't cite it. But um, So I want to throw that out. And that's actually going to be the bulk of this. And, uh, and this thing isn't going to go anywhere until some of these legal issues get sorted out. And so you know, there's kind of a number of, of moving parts here. and. I thought it'd be helpful just to kind of think a little bit about how all this works. So that's, that's where we're going. With valuation, thankfully, I've never tried to write a paper here. I think this is really hard. Um, there's, a, there's a huge literature, and I'm apology up right up front. I'm sure I've missed lots of the papers here. But think of this as just a sample. Um, you know, we have some nice theoretical models of, uh, of valuation. You know, they're out there. Uh, and, and I'm not quite sure we've, we've gotten the definitive models yet. We have a lot of empirical approaches, right? There was papers trying to say, well, it's kind of like gold. And, and then there's a paper by Herb which says it isn't actually kind of like gold. And then, then you have, you know, let's go the common equity route. And we saw earlier a paper that was talking about the Lewin, well, that paper, um, <laughs> that uh, the three factor model, you know, of trying to explain it. Um, you know, it's tricky because we're, te we're tempted to put it into a framework that we know, right? But they're not working well. Um, you know, there's a paper by, you know, Will Kong and, and other co authors. Um, that are also looking at various empirical approaches. There's a really nice paper by Cam that I would recommend called um, Investor's Guide to Crypto, I think, that actually develops some of the same ideas here. Um, and it's longer. Uh, so you can you know, learn even more if you look at Cam's paper. But um, lots of empirical approaches. Not clear we have a definitive answer yet. Um, the factor models. We have three factor models. We have five factor models. You know, I do think there are underlying factors. And, I, and the reason I think that is we're going to see, when I look at some of the microstructure, 
that there are things that clearly are at play here. But I'm not quite sure yet that that's going to be the direction that's going to win. And of course, what's fun about working in this area is that it's not exactly like the finance professors started all this, right? The CS guys did. And um, there's a lot of CS machine learning approaches, right? There's tons of machine learning papers in crypto, in, in um, doing, looking, looking at this, trying to predict, right? Lots of those are out there. And then there's the crypto specific measures, right? There's, you know, valuing crypto by looking at network value to transaction ratio, the NVT. There's something called Metcalf's Law, uh, which is something about the square of the number of users' accounts, right? I think when you think about using user accounts and addresses, it, you get frightened right away, or at least you should. There's even a very interesting thing that came out last year from the CFA, right? So for finance people, we know that's the Chartered Financial Analysts Association, and it really is kind of the institutional investor crowd, right? And they put out a really interesting paper on sort of how in the world should we value crypto. So I think that's another sign that's showing that the institutional side really wants to get in this. They're just not real sure yet. So. When you look at valuation, you know, it's a little sketchy, some of these approaches. So this is from the CFA Institute paper that's like, well, we're finance guys. We can value anything by a discounted cash flow model, right? Not a problem. But, I mean, look at this thing, right? I mean, first you need a growth rate, right? So here's the good news. There's a big growth rate. And, and then, then all of a sudden the growth rate's going to, you know, by 2020 it's going to fall off because if you try and value this thing using growth rates of 60% a year, you don't have enough decimals, right? <laughs> and then the terminal growth rate in perpetuity drops to 6.9. I don't know why, <laughs> but it seems like a nice number. It's a little bit like when you teach, you know, basic finance and people say, what's the cost of capital? And you say 10%, right? I mean, uh, you know, why not? Uh, and there's the terminal value of, you know, 321,000, um, which is nice because Ethereum is only around 3,000 now, but um, I believe you also have to be out in perpetuity to get that in this model. So, I, you know, I think they tried, and um, here's the present value, and here's the good news. It, it should be at 1,800, it's at 3,000. So. Maybe their growth estimates are way too low. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I think that it's useful to look at this to realize that if you're going to push this into a traditional approach, good luck, right? It, it's not, it's not going to fit, right? And that's okay because there are other ways. But I did find it intriguing that that they tried. Um, You've probably seen, you know, a lot of the institutions have put out research reports on how to look at these things. And what they really want is they want to think about how they would fit into a portfolio, right? Because, you know, we in finance do not like to just own one thing. We like to diversify. And so this, is, I think, is a nice, you know, sort of a research report Citicorp put out a couple of months ago. Basically saying, well, maybe this thing could really help. You know, maybe when equities are bad, Bitcoin is, is good, but that's not true, right? I mean, when equities are bad, so is Bitcoin. And uh, so you can kind of see the correlations don't help. Um, now, you know, these are looking at, you know, sort of this is a sample of equities, uh, the, the months where things were the worst. And, uh, you know, you do have this one little episode in 2019 that goes the other way, but. You know, if you're, if you're looking at this from the perspective of, boy, you got to put this in your portfolio because it's going to really help, you know, it's not going to help in the really bad months, that's for sure. And then this is the infamous Metcalf's Law, um, which is this number of users, you know, n squared. And, uh, you know, the, the good news is that both lines are going this way. And... Uh, that's about it, you know? I mean, I, I think the R squared is not real good here. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it's a tricky world how we're gonna get there. 
And um, you know, I hope that some of the people in this room are the ones who are going to get us there, because at least these approaches leave a lot to be desired. Um, so I'm going to kind of leave the valuation puzzle as, as a puzzle out there. I, there are papers that I think have, have made progress. I haven't highlighted them per se. But I just want to point out that you know, we may not think this is the most important challenge, but the institutional investors do. Right? So, you know, until we can convince them that, that, you know, this is not just a purely speculative thing that comes up and goes down and nobody really knows why, um, it's not going to get there to that asset class that we want. So what I want to actually spend more of the time on is talking about trading mechanics. So let's assume all of a sudden that, you know, we, we can get people feeling excited about valuations or at least convinced that this is an asset that always goes up. So if that's the case, you definitely want to buy it. So then the question becomes trading mechanics. So in microstructure, we tend to be very interested in kind of how trading occurs, not just, you know, our spreads this or that, but how's the best way to trade, right? And the reason we care about that is in general, no matter what the market is, it has two functions, liquidity and price discovery, right? And they're interconnected. But, you know, oftentimes people say, well, they don't care about the price. But that's not really good enough. Because if you're going to be an institution and you're going to trade, you care a lot about the liquidity. And therein lies kind of where I want to go with all of this, that when you think about how institutions trade other asset classes, like equities or, or fixed income or whatever, right? they use sophisticated trading tools and strategies that are designed to generate alpha, not necessarily from the portfolio selection, but from minimizing the transactions costs of implementing your trading strategies. So the asset prices are worried about generating alpha from portfolio selection, but the microstructure guys, we're very well aware that how well you trade makes a big difference. And here you're talking about electronic market makers, hedge funds, risk managers. They trade in, in sophisticated ways. And you would think that with crypto trading electronically, with trade bots an ubiquitous feature, that this should be the easy part, right? It's all electronic, you know. But when I was looking at a variety of these trade bot algos, they appear to use fairly basic approaches that take us back. Like, you know, 40, 30 years to technical analysis, you know, that, oh, you know, they're about to break through and, and, and momentum is, is big in the trade bots. Now, maybe some of you are trade bot designers and will assure me that you have more sophisticated things, in which case I'd be delighted to know that. But I, I don't think so. I think most of these are pretty basic. And this was fun. VPIN, the coolest market metric you've never heard of. Uh, so I like this. So this is from someone in Krypton Labs. Um, I hadn't heard from them either, so we're even. Uh, but um, <laughs> the point is, uh, I thought this was kind of interesting because, you know, I think they're beginning to think about these issues. How are you supposed to trade these things, right? Where are you going to find liquidity? And can you predict it? And that's... That's where I want to go here. And so, like I say, I'm interested in a sort of a question, do the price dynamics of crypto markets respond to the microstructure in ways similar to other asset markets? And this is a brand new paper that we've just finished. David is a co-author, and this is um, Tang Yang Yang and, and, and GB Yang, um, which is called Microstructure and Market Dynamics. I haven't presented it anywhere, because we just finished it uh, last week. But, it draws, it takes us to the extensive microstructure research on designing trade algorithms. So many people familiar with microstructure know a lot about, you know, the work about different exchanges and all that. But there's actually a very large literature that isn't generally published in most of the main finance journals. It's published in the sort of, you know, the, the, the mathematical finance journals. There's an army of people who write papers designing optimal trading algorithms. And in fact, David and Marcos Lopez de Prado and I have a paper in the Journal of Mathematical Finance where we designed a trading algorithm uh, actually based on VPIN. But 
the trade algorithm literature is quite large. And it, it, you know, in most of the settings where electronic trading is important, you know, that's how people trade, right? So if we're going to think about that, you know, can it, can it work here? So what we're going to do here is very similar to a paper that David Marcos and I and Jibe wrote uh, that's in the RFS 2022, I think, that was, calling, uh, was called um, Microstructure in the Machine Age, where we tried to see if we could use machine learning to predict liquidity in futures markets. And so this paper is kind of an offshoot, but we're wandering over here to uh, the crypto markets. And so we chose five um, you know, cryptos, we Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, you know, Ada, Cardano, and, and Solano. We're looking at data from Binance. And so we use one minute time bars, because that's what you have available. So you, you have one minute time bars, here's the price, and you have volume over these one minute time bars, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to predict market price dynamics um, one trading day ahead, right? So um, we've set kind of a high bond level here because I, I gotta, I'm, I'm going to look, you know, one minute time bars. I'm using machine learning. I make predictions every minute, right? And we're predicting liquidity dynamics one day ahead. <coughs> so this is a pretty high bar. Right? You would not really expect that we're going to be able to do very well. But if we can do OK here, then I think it tells us something about how these markets work. And it also means that if you want to start designing these algos with shorter horizons, which is you know, one day anymore is a long time, right? But you want to be careful with all this because of all the data that you've got to, you know, with machine learning, we got to test data and then we're, we're predicting. And so this is all out of sample and, and all those good things. But I think, I think the paper actually is going to give us some interesting thoughts on how this works. So we're, we're going to use random forest, which I think everybody in this room is probably familiar with. And you know, again, um, our sample period is going to run over, I think, it's, uh, I think it's January of 2021 through January of 23. So it's kind of nice. We've got crypto winter in there. And so what are we going to do? All right, so what are the features? And I didn't put any equations in this talk. Uh, so those of you who don't know what these things are, I'm just going to tell you what they are. So we have lots of measures in microstructure that tell us something about liquidity. Right? So the very first one was this roll measure, which um, Dick Roll created ages ago. And it, he'd created it in a world where we didn't have tick-by-tick -tick data. Right, so all you could see were prices, and so the mole measure is really the, it's the square root, the covariance between the, you know, delta, the price change at, at time t and the price time at t minus one. So it's kind of a correlation covariancey thing. The mole impact measure is the same thing, but it's divided by um, dollar volume, and so those are measures of autocorrelation of momentum, and they. They tell us something, you know, when they're big, they're, they're kind of significant. They, they suggest that transaction costs are higher and things like that. So they're older measures, but they still work pretty well. Then there's a classic, I always think of it as an NYU measure, because Yakov was here forever. Still is, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, so the, the Amiwood measure is uh, essentially looking at the return, right? over the volume, right? So the, it's actually the dollar volume. So it's kind of, how much volume does it take to generate the returns? And it's a measure of liquidity. So if a market's really liquid, right, then um, you, know, you, can, you can have lots of volume and it doesn't necessarily move much. But if, if a market's illiquid, then you can have you know, huge price movements on relatively small volumes. And then there are two measures that try and pick up the information aspect of all this. So there's the Kyle Lambda model, which when we think about things in microstructure, we probably have an un, a rather unholy focus on asymmetric information, right? We're very much afraid of people who know more than us. <laughs> and so if you're a market maker, right, you lose to the people who know more than you and you gain it up on the rest of us. So we're always busy trying to measure, right? 
how much asymmetric information is in there. And now the newer approach to that, it's the same thing, but now we call it toxicity. And so it's kind of asking, you know, how much in toxicity or if you want asymmetric information is out there. Right? And I, I used to think of it solely as asymmetric information, but again, it depends on your time frame. I was once down giving a talk at Jane Street. Uh, there's two of the people who founded Jane Street long ago, back when they were little kids, uh, in our MBA program took my class. So it's always fun when you see people actually do something. And uh, so I was giving a talk down there, and one of the guys there was saying, you know, toxicity is a big problem in the market. The one institutional investor I absolutely hate, it, it's the one I, I know I'm going to lose to, is CREF. Now, those of you who are academics know TIA Crafts are a pension fund, right? And I'm on the board at TIA Craft, and I'm like, Craft doesn't know anything, you know? <laughs> I guarantee you, Craft is basically an index investor. Because I know, but they keep coming, and they're always on the same side. You know, there's, it, it's, you know, an order, a buy, a buy, a buy, or a sell, a sell, a sell. It goes on forever, and I'm always on the other side. So if, you're, if your time frame is very short, then toxicity matters to you. And if your time frame is very long, toxicity still matters to you because you're going to lose in the long run to people who know more than you. So the Kyle Lambda tries to pick that up. But a, an important feature of the Kyle Lambda is it's asking how much prices change with respect to net volume. So that's a little different, right? And that's like if the buys and sells were equal, then that actually goes to zero, right? So it's a tricky one. VPIN is the metric that I just put up. This is a version of something that David Easley and I and, and Marcos Lopez de Prado did. It builds on models that David and I did. On, um, and and VPIN is, is a model of essentially um, un, imbalance between buys and sells. But it also includes a timing dimension because it uses a volume clock. right? So if there's not much information out there, you may not have anything happening. right? Nothing's going on there's a lot of information, then in fact, you may get a lot of trade. And so VPIN is this rather complicated thing that balances using a volume clock. So it, uh, it tries to incorporate sort of periods in which there's new information and where it shows up. That's all you really need to know, because what I want to know is can those things help us understand the, the price dynamics? Right? So again, I'm not trying to predict the price. I'm going to be interested in the, the, the variables that if you're designing algos, you care about, right? And so, uh, and, and because I'm using machine learning random forest, what I'm only predicting here is the change in the sign, right? So we're going to look here at realized volatility. We're looking at something called the uh, Jacques Barra statistic of realized returns. Um, some of you are, you know, stat whizzes and know all this. Um, what, what this statistic picks up is whether the distribution of the price changes is normally distributed, right? And it could be non-normally distributed for a bunch of reasons. One is skewness, right? And the other one is kurtosis. And the Jacques Barra statistic kind of puts them together, right? So, and then you also would be interested in the serial correlation of realized returns. And so why would you care, right? That's always a good question. So again, if I'm designing a, a trading algorithm, if realized volatility is expected to increase, then you'd want to increase the volume of the volume participation because that would reduce the uncertainty. Right? So you know, trade algorithms, they, they have horizons and they have speeds. And so you know, these things influence how much you want to do that. If predicted serial correlation is expected to increase, then it, it really depends on whether you're kind of buying or selling or whatever, but you change the optimal speed as well. So if you're, if you're kind of an electronic market maker, these are the kinds of things you think about. If the Jacques Barra statistic is expected to increase, then you're gonna, when you build your models, you have estimates of how much the implementation shortfall is gonna be. If, if that thing's expected to increase, then your estimates are gonna be too small, right? These are the sorts of things that, that if you want to think about the trading and the algorithms the way an institution does, then you need to think along the dynamics of this, right? So what are we going to find? 
Well, when we look at crypto, we find surprisingly high values for the mole measure and VPIN in crypto relative to equity markets. I mean, it's remarkably high. Um, so uh, VPIN, for example, in equity markets is somewhere, you can do VPINs of stocks and, you know, and they can be as low as 0.05 and, you know, 0.2, something like that. Futures markets, VPINs are around 0.4. These things are going to be like 0 0.47, 0 0.48. So one of the things I'll tell you up front is that when you look at these things through this lens, I will tell you that, that the crypto looks a lot more like futures. And they just do. And you know, as we think about all the legal issues, you know, the fact that these things look a lot more like futures is kind of interesting. But what's clear about this market is there's more momentum trading and there's more toxicity. Okay. We find strong predictability uh, microstructure measures uh, for future price dynamics. So this market is not efficient the way we like to think about it. The more inefficient the market, the better able you, you, know, you can predict. If the market's efficient, you know, you're going nowhere. But this thing isn't. This 0.53 and 0.54 may look relatively low, but that's not bad because remember, I'm going to predict every minute. So. You know, you do this like you know a million times. You, you know, that adds up. Um, and individually on these individual things that I'm the you know the labels labels I'm trying to do, it's 0.54 to 0.61. So I'm, I'm actually really good at being able to predict some of those labels. What I can't predict is skewness. We can't get anywhere on skewness, right? When we look at our skewness thing, it's 0.5. We can't predict it at all. Which is really interesting. So if you take the skewness out, then the AUC actually can get as high as 0.58. The skewness is bringing us down. So we couldn't predict skewness in futures either, which is kind of interesting, I think. Um, and um, most of the predictability is driven by roll and VPIN. Uh, we find cross effects are extremely important. So Bitcoin roll and Bitcoin VPIN and F roll and FV pin have strong predictive power for other currencies. So for example, if you were to see you know, the FV pin go up, it, it has different effects across the other currencies. And I'll show you pictures. Um, and what was really surprising to us was that our results were stable across our sample periods. Uh, so crypto winner had very little effect here. So the market dynamics that are driving the liquidity dynamics actually are fairly stable. That's a really good thing if you're an algorithm developer and you want to be doing that. So let's look at some pictures, all right? So we're going to look at mean decreased accuracy because I'm showing you the out of sample results, right? So, you know, we, we, we train all our, we, we have our testing period, you know, we, we, we do our training and then we come up with our machine learning pr prediction. And now we're out here in this sample, in this data that we've never played with. You know, we're doing good things. And um, so here we're trying to say, well, you know, what does a good job basically? What's contributing to the accuracy of estimates of um, well realized volatility? And again, here you can see the the role measure, which is picking up a lot of this momentum is really important. The autocorrelation is huge here. Um, Kyle's Lambda doesn't do much. Surprisingly, Amu doesn't do anything. And VPIN hangs in here pretty well. If we look, for example, um, this is kurtosis, right? Again, role measure is important. VPIN matters more here. And I think, I think it matters more here because the, the VPIN is picking up the imbalance. And, uh, that imbalance seems to matter. Again, Kyle's Lambda doesn't do much. Amy Hood's doing better here. Um, and again, the prediction window here is, is based on 50. So we have to have a look back windows. And so this is based on 50. We also do 100, 100 look back windows. Um, so depending on, on how you do all your machine learning stuff, you can get some different results. Um, this is realized volatility. Uh, aggregated and just kind of showing you that in some of these currencies, right, 
Um, the mole measure matters a lot. And, and you know, you can see here, Solano and, and uh, the green one is, is uh, Ada. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter for them, right? If you're going to trade those, the, the liquidity dynamics of those models are very different, um, which was kind of surprising. And again, I have here, like, look at the accuracy here. The, these things are, are, you know, from a machine learning guy's point of view, it brings tears to your eyes. This is great. Um, and again, this is whether you have a 50-bar look back or a 100-bar look back. But again, you know, they're, they're different when you look across these currencies, um, these, these cryptos. And, and some things just don't work very well. Um, so again, what if you sort of take all these variables now? Because those were looking at kind of own effects, right? How does my VPIN affect my currency? But that's not how markets work anymore, right? And so let's look at all the cross effects. So this is uh, aggregated mean decreased accuracy scores for Bitcoin using all 25 features. So that's each of the five vari features uh, across all the currencies. And so, you know, one of the things you see here for Bitcoin, the roll measure is extremely important. Uh, the VPIN measure for Bitcoin, these are own measures. And there's the Ethereum roll measure, right? So when Ethereum becomes kind of more, um, the, the, the autocorrelation's going up, the momentum's going up, that affects Bitcoin. And you can see the rest of the things, not so much, right? They're, they're just kind of lumping along there. Um, let's go to F. What affects F? Again, the roll measure, the VPIN measure, um, and, and here you see the roll Bitcoin measure is, is important for understanding the price dynamics of Ethereum. This is kind of um, ADA. Let's pick one of the ones who wasn't, you know, one of the main guys. Ah, this is really kind of intriguing. Um, so the Solano VPIN is more important than the ADA VPIN, right? So there are these very interesting cross behaviors about the liquidity. Remember, I'm not talking about the prices per se. I'm talking about the properties of these liquidity. And uh, so you end up, I think, with some very interesting sort of insights into how these markets are working. Now, why do I care, right? <laughs> You're probably wondering, why should you care? Uh, we, like I say, we wrote this paper um, looking at trying to understand liquidity in futures, right? So here's what's kind of interesting in futures, right? In futures markets, the Omnigrid measure is extremely important. This paper uses 84 different futures contracts. We use them all, the entire universe. And um, it, you know, the results we thought were pretty interesting. You know, what's driving it? You can see Ami Hood, you can see Roll. This is the 10-year the treasury roll, right? So these are all the, the futures contracts, and they keep going because we had 84 of them, right? And um, so, you know, this is the 10 year treasury, this is Euro bottle. Um, so, you know, what matters, right? And you can see there's some very interesting impacts. Uh, one of the things that was kind of interesting when we looked at futures markets is that the futures on the NASDAQ had a bigger impact on the behavior of futures volatility than the futures on, say, the S&P. You know, it's like, who knew? Uh, so I think as you begin to look at these models and you begin to think about these results, what it should help you is if you're a risk manager. Because the better your models are at predicting the risk and the better your models are at predicting your implementation, implementation shortfalls, the more likely you are to want to trade this. And I guess what we're hoping this shows is that the sorts of things that do work, for example, in treasuries, seem to, seem to hold up pretty well when we look at cryptos. So um, basically, we think that this is interesting, that the price dynamics of crypto markets respond in a way similar to other assets. And uh, we find that 
futures are similar. Um, the over short horizons, liquidity is predictable. And strong cross effects support common factors driving these dynamics. And that's why, even though I'm not sure that we've gotten the right factors, uh, there is a commonality in liquidity. And uh, it, you know, will it show up in asset prices? I don't know, but I'm a microstructure guy, so I don't care. Um, <laughs> in any case, um, before we end, I, I want to point out that you know we can get the valuation right, we can figure out all the trading mechanics. If the legal issues don't get settled, the future is kind of limited. Now, I'm more optimistic about where it's going. I, I am. I mean. We've got, you know, Bitcoin ETFs trading in Hong Kong. They, they start next week in London. Uh, we're all hopeful maybe we'll hear some good news about, you know, Ethereum today. I don't know. But in the long run, I, I hope that'll be the case. But without more clarity, it, it's, it's really hard. And, you know, this, there's so many issues here that I think are really difficult. And these are just grabbed from, you know, the, the recent, uh, you know, the recent month. SEC's power grab threatens U.S. innovation that, of course, is one of the Ethereum founders. You know, Robinhood got their, their Wells notice. Uh, Robinhood's used to this sort of stuff, though, so <laughs> I think they'll, they'll be fine. Uh, crypto industry sues SEC over new dealer rule. I mean, there are so many ways that the legal environment is simply n not clear enough for this to go well. Is there some hope on the horizon? Well, actually, you know, again, um, I think there is. Um, you know, is there a workable framework for tokens? This is from a document that was put out by a group of, of lawyers from top law firms and includes uh, one of the main authors is, is uh, Lee Schneider at Ava Labs where they propose guidelines for a particular token and uh, how, how to regulate tokens and, and you know, I, I think the argument isn't nothing should be regulated. The argument is we need to have a coherent system of regulation. And some things probably need more regulation than others. This is in mind, it's from a nice paper by Lee and Sylvia Sanchez, Understanding and Classifying Blockchain Tokens. But the, the bottom line is there, there are a bunch of pieces that have to fall into place. The good news is I like the microstructure piece. I think that's fallen into place. Um, but, you know, this is not the definitive study. It just gives us, I think, some very interesting suggestions of where things to go. So there's also a third possibility here. Maybe it all develops elsewhere. So this was just in the paper, I think, two days ago. Futures Exchange CME plans to launch Bitcoin trading. It's going to be in Switzerland. And it's for institutions. They want to build an exchange for institutions. But it ain't going to be here. So, you know, it, I, I think this market, as, as evidenced by this group, is here to stay, right? It just may not be here to stay. And, and that's, that's going to be up to the legal guys to sort out. So with that, thank you, and I'll, I'll quit.